All right, Acts chapter 5, we see in this chapter like the peak activity of the New Testament church. You know, the church is thriving, doing great works. It's an abundance of miracles, you know, wonderful works, like, you know, Matthew 7 says, <laughs> wonderful works. But you can see here, it doesn't stop the persecution from enemies. So, uh, uh, something booming and something doing well doesn't mean that there's an absence of persecution. So you don't want to think times are just good just because there's a lack of persecution. Because you can see here, even in the early church, when it's booming, when things are going really well, you know, and you know, God is with them and they got the apostles, persecution still abounds as well. So we can take that lesson first and foremost, that the Christian life is not one free from suffering, isn't it? You know, some people think, oh, you know, when I'm a Christian, life is meant to get easier. My life is going well and I'm growing spiritually. Is things are meant to be going on the up and up? Yes, spiritually they're going on the up and up, but spiritually on the up and up doesn't mean it's free from suffering. It's free from trouble. It's free from persecution. Right? So even when things are going according to the will of God, the Christian life is not necessarily one free from suffering. In fact, it's, it's the opposite, like we saw, you know, that, that there's suffering that God has all planned for us to help us to grow. Now let's break this chapter down into four sections and then let's uh, take some lessons from it. First section, we see Ananias and Sapphira and they are a, a very famous couple in the book of Acts because of what they did and what their punishment was. So let's look at it together. It says here, but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. So it's interesting because it's contrasted in the last chapter to, you remember Barnabas selling a possession and giving and being commended for it. These people did the same thing but went about it the wrong way, right? Sold a possession, kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? So a lot of people believe, and I believe too, that Ananias and Sapphira were saved. I don't believe saved people can be possessed, but I do think saved people can be influenced and attacked spiritually. So, you know, can, can, can saved people be attacked outwardly, you know, through, through spiritual attack? Yes. Can they be influenced? Yes, I don't think they can necessarily be possessed, right? Possessed meaning, you know, being in place of the Holy Ghost and being controlled, you know, demon possession. But here you can see that this thought that they get, Peter acknowledges that this is a satanic thought that they had to do this, right, in the early church. Why had Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, what is it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. So what does that mean? He, he, was, he died. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. So what is happening here, right? So the, so the sin here is not that they sold a property and didn't give it all. Right? Because you can see here that Peter's saying, hey, when, once you sold it, wasn't it, it was in your power to do what you wanted with it. This is also evidence, like I said before, that this is not a communistic socialist society, right? Where it's un involuntary. So they're selling this, they're giving it, but even Peter says here that, hey, you, you, it's in your power to do what you want. Once you sold it, you could have gave it to the church, you could have gave part, it's up to you. But what was the problem here? The problem here is that they pretended to give the whole amount to make them look like they did what Barnabas did, but they did it. They kept back part of the price of the land. So let's say today you sell a property for 600, seven, well, I guess in Sydney it's like 1.2 million, 1.4 million for just like you know, a little shack across the road. Um, you know, but you say, oh, I'm giving the whole part to God, right? You know, all 1.4 million, but you actually sold it for 1.6 million, 1.8 million, whatever. That's basically what they did. So the sin here was not that they, that they didn't give the whole part. The, the sin here was that they pretended to give the whole part, but they didn't. 
for their own glory. But I think, see, at the root of the issue here is, you know, God is making an example of them, not because he just feels strongly about people not giving the whole amount or, or, or people pretending to give a certain amount and, and not giving the whole amount. I don't think that's the focus, right? I personally think the fundamental root of the issue here is that there is a lack of fear of God. You know, like what made Ananias and Sapphira think they could get away with this? I mean, maybe today when we don't have even apostles, right? But it's the same Holy Ghost back then as the Holy Ghost today, right? But then Christians, you know, whether they are two-faced at church and they do something else outside, what makes you think you're getting away with it? You know, God sees all. God knows what's going on. And same here. Did they not believe that God knew how much they sold the price for? But it's just now in the early church, God wanted to make an example of them, right? So... It was revealed to Peter that he knew that they were lying and he was, you know, uh, pulling them up on it. And then they suffered some very serious consequences. So what do I think the root of the issue here is? In my, in my opinion, this is what, how I think, is that there was a lack of a fear of God, you know, in the people here. So God was making an example of somebody in the New Testament church for, for a serious sin, Right? where they were trying to take glory for themselves, but, you know, I mean, glory should be given to God. But I think it's this, it was the lack of fear of God that God was trying to stamp out in this early church where Ananias and Sapphira didn't even fear God enough to, to, to pull such a stunt, you know? And, and this is amongst... Imagine the early church. I mean, here, you know, we don't have anyone of, of notable stature here, you know? The, in the early church, you know, that's like amongst Peter, James, John. They want to pull this out. It's like they don't even fear the leadership that is there either to, to be in tune with God, to know what is going on. But the same thing happens today. And, you know, maybe I don't know what's going on. Maybe in other churches, the other church leaders may not going on. They may not have special revelation insight from God. But, you know, I will say to you that the same Holy Ghost that ruled back in the church back then is ruling in the church today. So take heed. You know, this is an example where God chastises saved people, even with death. You know, so we don't want to have a lack of fear of God in our life. And this is why I think this, this portion of the passage, you know, it ends in verse 11 with, you know, a great fear came upon all them in that early church. So where do we also see this? In 1 Corinthians 11, we see people not giving reverence, I believe, this is what, how, how we interpret it in this church, not giving reverence to the Lord's Supper. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. This is why when we have communion, you know, I don't think, I don't believe communion should be a sorrowful event like some churches make it. I think it should be a time of joy, but I do think it should be a sober event too. You know, it should be something like, like I was saying last time we broke bread, said it's, it's like a minute of silence. It's something where people, you reflect soberly and gravely on something. You should treat it with the respect and fear that it deserves. And I think it's tied in to, you know, them not fearing God in Acts 5. And here, they didn't even fear God enough to treat the Lord's table with the respect that it deserved, not discerning the Lord's body, not even doing it seriously. For this cause, look at this, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. So it's not that everyone's sickness or infirmities or when people maybe die suddenly, it's not that it's always attributed to the sins that they do, but I tell you what, it can be, right? That is a possibility that God's chastisement includes death, right? And the fact that it can include death and serious illness, you know, that ought to make you fear God in that sense. Now, that, is that the best motivator? Is the best motivator in your spiritual life that you just, fear, you just fear of chastisement? It's not, right? The best motivator is that you love God and you want to do things for God out of gratitude, out of gratefulness. 
But you know what? There is that other side, just like parenting. There is that other side, whereas if that's not a good enough motivator for you, that primary motivator, God has other ways of motivating people too and ensuring that they have a healthy fear of God in them. Let's continue, Acts 5, 7. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. So it's not only that her husband had the boldness to collude together, to lie to the church, but also the wife, right? Then Peter said to her, said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and, ca- and found her dead and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. So we see here as well that the young men were the laborers in the early church. So that's a good you know, reminder to you young men in the church. I mean, most of the men in our church are young. You know, don't be lazy. You know, don't let the women do everything. You know, don't let the old, older generation do everything. You know, if, any, if anything, it's the younger guys should be the most busy going about getting stuff done around the church, right? Getting the physical stuff done. Okay, so like here, you know, it wasn't the old men, it wasn't the ladies that carried the person forth to go bury, um, bury the people, it was the young men. Young men came in, found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. So, you know, I know it's not ideal scenario in terms of burying bodies, but I think the principle is there nonetheless. That's, they were a good example that they went up to do the, the less pleasant jobs, right? Um, and set the good example there. Now, one thing I think we can take from this is, look, there, there is not an expectation from God for a wife to follow in the sins of the husband. So we know in Ephesians 5.24, we won't read the whole passage, but this verse in particular, therefore as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So there is an obligation in the Bible with the roles of husband and wife that the wife is subject to her husband and obedient in all things. But that doesn't mean that we don't take into account what God expects from people. Remember Romans 13 and others, that we submit unto the higher powers. So it, there was a like, likewise, there was a hierarchy in the laws in the Old Testament where you know, there were laws to do with the Levitical priesthood, but it didn't negate other laws that superseded it in terms of love and things like that. So if you remember when, when the priest fed the showbread to David and his companions and Remember they were saying, Jesus was saying, hey, it wasn't lawful for them to eat. But why was it okay in that instance? Because mercy, grace, love can supersede some of those things. So we're not saying that those laws don't apply. But we're saying that those laws always need to be understood in the context of other laws that exist too. So it's the same here. This law here is not saying that you obey your husband no matter what he tells you. Right? Because we can see in the Acts 5 example that they, a husband and wife colluded together, yet the wife was still asked, is this the right thing? She could have said, no, it wasn't. You know, we didn't sell it for that much, and maybe she would have been spared. So, so it's not that in this instance in particular that she, you know, the husband just lied and both of them were killed. Right? She could have actually done the right thing and been spared that judgment, but she didn't. She went along with her husband. But my point is that you know, God does not expect wives to participate in the sins of the husband. You know, so it is right for the wife to do what's right by God. And, you know, I know that line is not always easy to know where it is, but the principle is there nonetheless that wives are subject to God first and foremost and then to their husband second, even though, you know, the Bible teaches here that the wives be subject to their own husbands in everything. We don't negate that. And it's the same later on when we talk about being subject to the laws of the land. Uh, Verse 11. And this is why I think the fundamental issue here of what God is trying to make a point out of is that this, this lack of fear of God, right? And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. So, you know, Business, quote-unquote, is booming. 
you know, preaching the gospel, people are being added to the church, miracles abounding, boldness. You know, sometimes when times are going well, we start to take God for granted. You know, it's the same with in any, any life situation. When things are going well, people start getting a bit more overconfident. They start not respecting the authorities that are in place, God included. Right? So we don't want that attitude. We don't want to think, hey, our life is going great. We're prosperous. We're free. Church is going well. That we don't treat the things of God with the reverence and fear that are due to them. Okay? So, first lesson is have a healthy fear of God. Number two, we're looking to the gift of healing. The gift of healing. Acts 5. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest, durst no man join himself to them. So that's saying that there was a portion of people that were willing to join, with the, join the church, join the disciples, and there was a bunch of people that weren't. So when it says, and of the rest, durst, if you don't know what the word durst means, durst is the past tense of dead, of dead, sorry. So it's just another way to say dead. Durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. So even though there was a group of people that, you know, were adversarial to what was going on, still people realized something is going on here, you know, even though they may not have joined themselves to them. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women. So this is what I mean by this, like, this is like peak activity in the early church, which things are happening in that early church and people are, uh, you know, getting involved in church, plenty of things, you know, plenty of uh, resources and they have all the authority of all the apostles there and it's like, it's, it's booming. But, like I said, it's not free from persecution and as we see later on in Acts, even more persecution comes to spread them out. In so much that they brought, look at this, in so much that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. So you see like the, the, the great power of the gift of healing that is going on in the early church that it, it didn't even require like the laying out of hands. They're just like laying people in the streets and just the shadow passing by is enough to heal them. So, what, what I think we can see here is just how active this gift of healing is in the early church. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick fo folks, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, everyone. And they were healed, everyone. Just, that's, 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 that's insane if you think about that, Right? It's like the, the gift of healing was, that, I think, such at a climax at this point where just droves of people just bringing in, laid down, and it's just everyone's just getting healed. You know? It's nuts. And you think, you know, even people seeing all this, knowing what's going on, still did not want to join themselves to the apostles. You think, if that was going on, I mean, that's the crew I want to be with. But it's like the last chapter we looked at. Which one do you fear more? Do you fear God more or do you fear man more? Because, you know, all of us will say, yeah, we fear God. Yeah, we're going to stand with God. Yeah, if God be for us, who can be against us? And when the persecution comes, you know, government implements some fines, government implement, implements, you know, some things, it just makes it a little bit difficult, will you still fear God? Because that's what was happening here. They, they feared God the religious leaders and the authorities more than they feared God. That's why they didn't want to join themselves to them. But you would think, if you're going to join the early church at any time, it's going to be this point in time, right? Where everything's going, it's flourishing, it's booming. But, you know, hey, fear is a powerful motivator. And which one are you going to fear more? You're going to fear God more, you're going to fear man more. Well, we can see here that miracles are abounding in the early church. But I believe they began to cease as time went on. But look here, everyone's getting healed. Just brought, just the shadow passes over, you're healed. So why then do we see sick people 
in the New Testament epistles, if this gift of healing was around. Like I said, I think this is evidence that these gifts, like we talked about in Acts chapter 2, these gifts, the gifts of tongues, these gifts start to cease as time went on and as the Word of God was beginning to be established. Philippians 2, Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that he had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick, nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Paul had the gift of healing, why didn't he just heal Epaphroditus? Well, it's because I believe these things were starting to fade as they were no longer needed for the purpose for which they were given. 1 Timothy 5, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine, look at this, often infirmities. So Timothy is getting sick quite often. The apostles are around at this time. Why don't they just get healed? Well, you know, like I said, I think this is evidence that these things are starting to fade. 2 Timothy 4, Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. 2 Corinthians 12, and this is Paul, so a lot of people believe his thorn in the flesh could possibly be a health problem. Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. So the lesson I want you to take away from this portion of the chapter is, you know, the gift of healing was there, I think, for a specific purpose, to get the word out. That's why we see this abundance of healing in Acts. Don't get the expectation that this is something that happens today, because it wasn't even happening near the end of Paul's ministry, right? They had illnesses, and Paul reflected on it correctly, saying, hey, well, I have these infirmities and what was the purpose of them? Because I didn't want to glory in my own strength, my own abilities, giving glory to God. My grace is sufficient for thee, he's reflecting on. So there is another purpose for infirmities too. You know, not just to be there to be healed, but there to glorify God when people go through infirmities and yet give glory to God anyway. So don't be discouraged if you have an infirmity and you are not healed, right? You should... Take a lesson from Paul here. Glory in the Lord. Know that my grace is sufficient for thee and that God's strength is made perfect in your weakness. Okay, so, you know, a lot of people, you know, in the Pentecostal movement out there, you know, I was healing, all this healing, you know, a lot of it I don't even think is the same sort of thing that we see in Acts. But, like I said, don't have the expectation this is just all happened to say. Yes, we pray for healing. We can, we can commit things to God. Sometimes God is gracious. But we don't always need to expect it because we see at the end of the ministries, infirmities are starting to abound, you know, and they're not necessarily getting healed for other reasons now, to bring God glory in other ways. All right, let's continue. Third section is obey God rather than men. So this is consistent with the thing we were talking about before, that we fear God more than man. That's going to help us obey God rather than man. And we see that from the disciples in this chapter as well. Then the high priest rose up and all that they were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. So that's hatred. And laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. So this time they forcefully take them, right? But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, go, stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. So they get arrested for preaching you know, the resurrection and the gospel. They're put in prison, and that night, the angel of the Lord opens up the prison doors and probably closed them again after they went out, because when the guys came back, they said, they came and we saw the prison shut. So, you know, this angel's got good habits, right? You open the door, close it behind them. Right, kids? 
Uh, the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors, brought them forth, said, Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this light. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came, and they that were with him called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. So there's a meeting of the leaders and go, hey, we're going to, like last time, we're going to interrogate them again, bring them before us. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, the prison truly found we shut with all safety. So this is how I know the angels closed the door behind them. And the keepers standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these things, they doubted of them, whereunto this would grow. See, so they even, see, even the, the leaders at the time, this is like, they, they, I don't know, you know, you know, whether they, a lot of them, a lot of them obviously were like, I think maybe reprobate in the sense of like, they just did not want to believe and they couldn't believe even after seeing all these. But they knew something was up. See, they knew that they, they jailed these people and now they're let go. So they, they, know, they recognize that a lot of miracles are happening and even they can't even keep them in prison. You know, they're escaping. So, you know, it's always very curious to know what else is going through their mind besides just the hatred of what's going on and the hatred towards Jesus Christ. Men came on, so they're thinking like in verse 24, like what's going on? And then somebody, you know, rushes in, comes in. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom he put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. So you arrest them for preaching, you put them in prison, and the next day they're back, they're back there, right? Which is just great boldness on their part. That's what I mean by this. this is so encouraging from the disciples here. That, you know, when the angel let them out, he, they didn't, it's not like he let them out and said, hey, well, look, that got you arrested, so let's try a different tact, right? It was like, no, that got you arrested, I'm going to let you out and go to do the exact same thing that got you arrested, right? So it just goes to show there that we have verses in the Bible which are often misused, and like I talked about with, you know, submitting to your husband, that we submit to the authorities that God has put over us. But see, we can see here in Acts 5, this is not just a blind allegiance or a submission to human government without considering the will of God. Because if that was the case, why would they not just submit to what they said to them? Right? No, and it shows here that the angel of the Lord came and actually condoned them going back and going against the clear instruction that they were to not continue to preach this thing. 1 Peter 2, verse 13. So here's uh, the, mainly the two passages that people talk about when they talk about submitting to governments. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God, honour all men, love the brotherhood, Fear God, honour the king. And then the, the more famous one, Romans 13, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore will res therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute also. That's like taxes. For they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honour to whom honour. So yes, there is a teaching in the Bible that Christians should strive to be law-abiding, tax-paying citizens, right? But that does not negate the will of God, right? So that's why there's a conscience issue here. To what extent do we submit to human government when there is something that God 
God wants that may be contrary to what the government wants, right? So, you know, people often were, were critical of me being arrested, protesting COVID and all that sort of stuff, and other pastors that were standing up, doing the right thing, getting into trouble with the law. But you can see here, if you just look through the book of Acts, you're in good company when you're trying to do something right, you're trying to do the will of God, and you are getting in trouble with the authorities, right? So let's go on. Acts 5, 26. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. So you can see here that the, 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 the balance of power is starting to shift with the influence of the people. And this time, they don't bring them violently. They bring them more consensually. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? See, so it's not that they accidentally went against what was commanded of them. And I mean, the instructions and the directions were quite clear. Stop doing this. But they did it anyway. They were bold in their rebellion against the wrong authority, instructions from, um, from the authorities of the day. And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon them. What a great, what a great uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, what a, what a great like, accusation. Like, what a great insult. You know, if, if you were to have any insult from somebody, it's like, you are being too effective as believers. How dare you? You know, like Greta Thunberg. How dare you? <laughs> being good, good believers, you know? Filling Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. So what an, in, what an insult, what an accusation, and, and what a response. You know, I just love, you know, the, the, the situation here. You know, and I just would to God that we would have this boldness if in a similar situation. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a saviour, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey him. So they say something very similar that they said in the previous chapters, basically testifying the exact, exact same thing, even the thing that's getting them in trouble. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. So the directions given by, by the authorities to the apostles was not vague, it wasn't, it wasn't unclear. But why did they have boldness to obey God rather than men? Because they feared God more than they feared men. Now they're not just trying to silence them. Now they're trying to kill them, right? But see, even though the authorities act outwardly, you know, like they are not threatened, they know what is happening is a threat to their influence, right? So what I want you to take heart here is, you know, and this is how I try and encourage myself in, in, in the things that we do, is the lesson from this one is don't underestimate your impact spiritually or politically, right? Because on the face of it, Maybe the disciples just thought, well, we're just going to obey God even if we're getting persecuted. And the face of it was, well, these guys aren't intimidated. We're not intimidated, but, you know, they're just treating us the exact same way. But we get some insight in Acts into the inner mind of these leaders. And we can see here that they were concerned. They did trouble them. And I think that can encourage us as we go about spiritually, politically. We may not think that we're causing more of an impact than we do, but I think we are. I think when, you know, it, you know, it just reminds me of the federal election, right? You know, when something was happening in our electorate, you know, they, they saw the volunteer. They, they took notice, that's my point. They took notice. It's not that we were just being ignored. And the last section, being persecuted for righteousness' sake. Being persecuted for righteousness' sake. Acts 5.34.
Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. I am verily a man... Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, so, uh, that depends on, sorry. That's Acts 22. So, now Gamaliel gives his advice to the religious leaders. Now, who is Gamaliel? Gamaliel, we know, is one of the respected religious leaders here in Jerusalem. But if you didn't know, Paul mentions that he was actually taught by Gamaliel. So Gamaliel was actually one of Paul's mentors. So, yeah, just, I think it just goes to show like, how intertwined Paul was with the religious leaders of the day, that when he you know, was consenting unto Stephen's death and then he converted, you know, how hard that must have been to go back and face all his old mentors you know, that would have known him personally because he, he was raised by them. I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, the city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous toward God as you, are, as you all are this day. So it just gives you a bit more perspective over when Paul says that he counted all these things but dumb for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, his Lord, that, you know, he had a lot of pressures. It wasn't just the persecution, but... You know, even the social stigma. You know, the social stigma keeps people keep on doing like orthodox and Catholic practices that they ought not to be doing. So you think, you know, oh yeah, social stigma is not persecution. Yeah, well, social stigma today makes Bible believing Christians do things that they ought not, right? Sprinkling their children, going, you know, going to you know orthodox and Catholic uh, traditional things. So that pressure is there. I mean, Paul had that pressure too, but he. You know, he faced that pressure and he counted it all but dung to do what was right by the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go on, verse 35, Acts 5. And said unto them, ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rode up Thutis, boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, about 400, joined. So, so what is Gamaliel talking about? Now he raises two examples of people that gathered a following and then fizzled out, right? To whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves. So these are not small movements. I mean, look, there's the 400 people. I mean, here you can say, well, Victor gathered to himself you know, 50 people. So these are quite large movements that are going on here. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away much people after him, he also perished, and all, even as many as, as obeyed him, were dispersed. Makes me wonder whether this guy was like a libertarian, you know, like he was against the taxing, he rose up, and then uh, that fizzled out too. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men, so he's saying, leave them alone, let them alone, for if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. So he's saying, look, if this is just a movement of man and not of God, it'll fizzle out like Thutis and Judas. But if it be of God, he cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. So what was Gamaliel's advice? Gamaliel's advice was, hey, look, just leave them be. If it's of, if it's, if it's of men, it's going to fizzle out like Thutis and Judas. If it's of God, maybe you're just fighting against the will of God, right? Now, is what Gamaliel said true? No, I don't think what he said is true. That was just his opinion. Now, was that on his heart? Was it God put it on his heart just to give the disciples some space, some breathing room? Who knows, right? But this is how it played out. Maybe he saw it as the politically expedient response because he's like, well, if we push too hard, you know, there's going to be an uproar. You know, they feared the people that when they took the apostles that they were going to get stoned. So it might have just been the political response, but maybe he delivered it to them in a way where they would accept it to say, oh, okay, well, we're doing what's righteous, you know, we don't want to fight against God, you know, we just let it be. But his advice is not true in the sense that just because something doesn't fizzle out doesn't mean it's of God, right? Islam has not fizzled out. That's not of God. You know, the Jehovah's Witnesses have not fizzled out. That's not of God. You know, Mormonism has not fizzled out. 
that's not of God. So there's plenty of examples to show that this, this counsel is not necessarily true. It's just their response to just leaving the disciples alone. Verse 40, and to him they agreed, so they went along with his advice, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, so they still brought them and beat them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So that goes back to my point about what's going on in the minds of the religious leaders and how they were threatened by the influence and by that movement, but they didn't necessarily show it. And this is why I think we can take some encouragement here that that definitely occurs even though they still have that sort of walled front. They beat them unjustly, commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the council, from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Right? So that's the right attitude. Where did they get that attitude from? Well, Jesus told it of them. Matthew 5, verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You know, it's like always a good reminder. If you take a position that is for God and you are persecuted for it, I think your thought, first thought should be, well, this is great. I just earned some rewards in heaven. You know, it's a great opportunity. You know, bring it on. You know? Yes, it's not always pleasant to be persecuted. Nobody's saying that you should enjoy the persecution. You're rejoicing. Why? Because your reward is great in heaven. And I think the disciples recognize that. That is why they maybe were so willing at the time. You know, it's booming, things are going on, they've got great boldness. They're willing to go, great, here's another opportunity to be persecuted and to earn more great rewards in heaven. Maybe that's why the next, you know, they brought them by violence the first time, but remember the second time it was, they, they asked them to come along. Maybe that's why they were still willing to go along, because still willing to face that persecution, earn more rewards in heaven. James 1, 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And the last verse, the last verse, Acts 5, 42, And daily in the temple and every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. So the persecution didn't stop them from winning souls. What stops you from winning souls in comparison? You know, we just went through what they went through. I mean, is that what you go through? Some people stop going soul winning because somebody was a bit rude at the door. Some people go, don't go soul winning anymore Oh, because nobody wants to listen. Might be other reasons. Laziness, lack of priority. You know your reason. But what I want you to reflect on today is what stops you from winning souls in comparison to what the disciples went through? The disciples are beaten. They are mocked. They are brought before governing authorities. They are threatened with their very lives. And yet the Bible says daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. They didn't quit on God when it got hard. Well, you quit on God just because life is a little bit hard, but nothing in comparison to what they went through. So the last lesson I want to give you is don't quit on soul winning. What we go through pales in comparison to what the disciples went through. They didn't quit. Jesus didn't quit. Don't you quit either. All right, so four lessons for you. Have a healthy fear of God. Don't be discouraged if you're not healed from your infirmities. Glory in God. Don't underestimate your impact spiritually or politically. 
And number four, don't quit on soul winning. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we uh, thank you for the example set by the apostles. May it encourage, ex exhort, and rebuke us. Lord, I pray that we would have even a fraction of the boldness that the disciples showed in the early church. And uh, Lord, I pray that, you know, if uh, things get bad in our lives, I pray that we don't quit on you. We fear you more than we fear man. Help us, Lord, to have boldness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.